Body Logic Physiotherapy, empowering people to achieve better health. Welcome to Episode 6 of the Empowered Beyond Pain Podcast, proudly brought to you by Body Logic Physiotherapy. For the last two weeks, we've spoken about the myths and facts of low back pain, including hearing patient stories of recovery. But this week's episode kicks off a four-week mini-series on the topic of osteoarthritis, in particular hip and knee joint pain. Today you hear two people talking about joint pain, but not just any two people, two professors. That's right, mano e mano, professor e professor. Peter O'Sullivan, Professor of Musculoskeletal Pain and Specialist Physiotherapist at Body Logic Physiotherapy, chats to Stefan Lormander, a leading voice on osteoarthritis, orthopaedic surgeon and emeritus professor from Lund University in Sweden. The profs talk about the potential ignorance and lack of understanding about the disease and how surgery may not be the big fix for osteoarthritis that everyone had hoped for. Later in the episode, I talk to Pete and JP about the common misconceptions around osteoarthritis, our current understanding of it, and why the term bone on bone may be an unhelpful and inaccurate term, as well as what you can be doing to improve. We also discuss an infographic that has been created to accompany a fantastic paper that JP Canero led in collaboration with surgeons and other international professors to help change the narrative around osteoarthritis. You can find that infographic as well as all the resources discussed in this episode over on the show notes page which is www.bodylogic.physio forward slash podcast. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and remember to ask, is there more to pain than damage? Stefan, thanks for um, having this opportunity to have a chat. Um, we were discussing before that this issue of musculoskeletal pain and the burden that it carries is a huge problem uh, for society. And uh, the costs are going up and the disability burden seems to be going up with it. Mm-hmm. Um, your background's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and within the health system, there seems to be a lot of attempts to try and fix the problem of musculoskeletal pain. How do you see the role of surgery in that space? The surgery is an important part of dealing with uh, these conditions, musculoskeletal and in particular osteoarthritis, which I specialize in. But it's not possible to do a big fix just with the use of surgery. Clearly not sustainable Mm. in the big picture. So how do you see within uh, contemporary understanding of musculoskeletal pain where it's about a management of a patient and the patient journey. How do you see the role of surgery within that? Well, the patient, most of the patients actually have quite a long journey as osteoarthritis patients and most of that journey is taken without and for most of the patients is without surgery and the need for surgery. The major part of the life in osteoarthritis that these patients spend is actually using other forms of management and that's where I think we are having major challenges today. Can you talk about those forms of management? I would argue that uh, there is a large uh, part of ignorance and lack of understanding of the disease. Patients as well as practitioners need to to understand the disease better. We also need to look at the different practices that we have today, the different forms of management, and we need to look hard at what might be low value management, low value care. We need to take that out of the picture and consider what is actually providing value for the patient. So could you give me some examples of where low value care exists in surgery? In surgery? Yeah, say for knee pain. Yes, that would be for patients who've had a bit of a journey through their osteoarthritis uh, disease and are getting to the point where they may have tried analgesics, they may have tried uh, various things on the way, perhaps have a bit of an exercise program as well, uh, which we often try to get them into, but then they come up to the surgeon through various routes, uh, through referrals or through 
through own referral. And there is a consideration of, for example, arthroscopic surgery, which is frequently the case. It's a very frequently practiced uh, procedure. One of the most common orthopedic uh, procedures, actually. And that has now been shown through uh, many studies that doing arthroscopic surgery in the middle-aged and older person with chronic knee pain is not helpful really. Mm. It's actually low value care and it's been shown in a series of studies that for example a structured exercise program is as effective in treating the problems that these patients have as surgery. So within the current health climate how do we replace low value care like arthroscopic surgery with high value care given that the funding seems to go to low value care? Yes, that is a challenge and it's a challenge for many reasons because number one, the patient often expects a quick fix when they reach that point, when they reach the consultation with the orthopedic surgeon in this case, they expect the orthopedic surgeon to provide the final and quick fix to their problem. They've tried this, they've tried that, and now they ha- are looking at the final solution, so to mm-hmm. say, to their problem, while actually this procedure is not the final solution mm-hmm. to their problem. And secondly, the healthcare system, as you're suggesting, may actually be funding, subsidizing surgery while not subsidizing, for example, Uh, an exercise program led by a physiotherapist or some other form of exercise program. Mm. And thirdly, there is also, of course, the the, uh, routines that are ingrained in the system we work in where, for example, the general practitioner, the GP, might refer the patient with a knee problem, uncharacteristic knee problem, to the orthopedic surgeon and on the way by the way, do an MRI investigation or MRI scan, for example, leading to the finding of a tear of the meniscus. And then the patient has knowledge about the tear in the meniscus mm-hmm. in the knee, has pain in the knee, and is in the office of the orthopedic surgeon. What do you expect? Yeah. So how do we change that system? I think we need to really get the information out there, the understanding out there that the evidence is now quite consistent and that few, if any, of these patients that I'm trying to summarize quickly here actually benefit from the arthroscopic surgery more than they would benefit from an exercise program. Mm. And if this exercise program costs a fraction of what the surgery does, if the exercise program does not have any adverse events associated with it, in contrast to the surgery, and so on and so forth, I think there is a lot of good arguments and strong arguments and we need to get this information out to the patients, to the GPs, to the surgeons of course, and to the, perhaps most importantly, to those who make the decisions about what is subsidised by healthcare and what is not. So Pete and JP, we've just listened to Stefan's interview and uh, one of the things that he raised was that there's quite a, I guess, a a misunderstanding of what osteoarthritis is amongst the public. So I was hoping that maybe you, Pete, could talk about what are the common misconceptions around osteoarthritis? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we as human beings tend to have a simplistic view of the human body and often we see it as a piece of machinery. So a piece of machinery like in your car, you've got a worn joint, what do you do? You whip it out, you replace it. You squirt a bit of you know lubricant into it. Um, you probably don't use it as much if you don't, you want to preserve it. Um, so you avoid loading it, you might not take it on rough roads, etc. And I think we have translated that view to the human body that um, uh, this idea of arthritis is you know your joints wearing away and so there's narrowing of the cartilage and that bone rubbing on the bone and the, then you've got to preserve it so you what are your options you clean it up which is surgery and Stefan talked about arthroscopic surgery is like not doing what we thought it did um, you might inject it um, with uh, you know various 
products that might meant to be in, improve the lubrication, you, the natural tendency for someone who is um, thinking that they've got a joint that is arthritic is that it's dangerous to load it uh, and to move it. Um, and in actual fact, it's the opposite. <laughs> so these are very common beliefs that people have. It's that um, this is, that means that that tissue is not safe to load, or that it's got, the more you use, it, you know, wear it out. So we hear things like, um, you know, people having strong beliefs that running will wear your knees out, that uh, using bending and moving and loading your legs is dangerous for them because it, you know you've only got to last a certain life, a bit like a car tire or a, a part of a car. Um, and and those beliefs unfortunately lead people down a pathway to think that the only solution for them is um, to clean it up, trim it up, uh, inject it, replace it. Uh, and the problem for that is is that um, uh, one is you're missing out on all kinds of opportunities to care for your health of your knee, which JP will talk about in a second. But the other thing is is that once you've had those treatments. Uh, there's a sense of, well, why didn't it work? And so I had a lady in just um, a couple of weeks ago who's had two knee replacements, uh, and she's really uh, profoundly distressed that um, neither of her knee replacements have given her the level of function she had prior to her first knee replacement, um, and her knee pain um, is still present, and now she's got a knee she can't trust, and uh, and, and she can't function and so she feels like she's really hit a roadblock in terms of her life. So um, probably that, that whole belief system has led people down a pathway but also an expectation around when that care may not, uh, it can work well for some but for not for all. And it's very rare for people who've even had a knee replacement to become pain free. Uh, we know that a lot of people do have functional limitations and ongoing discomfort even after they've had the ultimate treatment, which is to replace a joint. And so I think what that speaks to is that the fundamental beliefs we have about arthritis uh, don't really play out in terms of the ways in which we act. And that's why we've got this massive societal problem of pain and disability around that problem. And, and I think it highlights that we need to have a new understanding of what, what arthritis means and is and how we care for it. Yeah, sure. So is it fair to say then, to kind of summarise what you're saying there is that we uh, a traditional understanding of osteoarthritis was that your joints wear out the more that you use them. But mm -hmm. our current understanding, which I'm going to ask you to kind of elaborate on, JP, is that actually we're almost the opposite as human beings. Well, we are the opposite. The more that we use our joints progressively and, and under the right conditions, actually the healthier and the stronger they get. Mm -hmm. um, so, JP, I was wondering, you're a, a clinician, a specialist physio, um, but also a researcher researching mm -hmm. arthritis. So can you talk to um, what is our current understanding of osteoarthritis? Yeah, so the, the understanding has evolved from thinking it's just the bone structure and the wearing of the cartilage to a perception that is more around the whole joint that gets affected. But what actually contemporary understanding of pain has been telling us is that it, it's more than that. It's a whole person condition where every factor that affects your health, your whole health, uh, can affect the experience of your of your knee pain. So as Pete was saying before, if you believe that your knee joint gets worse with loading and you have bone on bone, that will make you worry and get concerned about that leg, will make you avoid putting weight on that leg, will make you protect and guard that leg, and that can create further stress in that joint. We also know that other factors such as your sleep, your mood, uh, your stress levels, they can affect, they can change the chemistry of your body and they can sensitize structures in your knee so um, in the past you know for you to have a clinical diagnosis of OA you needed to have an x-ray in addition to pain and function limitation and that has changed over the years because what they found is that you can have uh, high levels of pain and li uh, functional limitation without having as much change in your knee joint and one of the reasons for that is because these changes in your uh, in other factors in your life they can affect the sensitivity of knee structures and they can make that joint become uh, sensitive and sore. So when we look at uh, managing a person with, uh, with osteoarthritis, we are looking at their knee. We'll, if they do have an x-ray, which is very common, we'll look at the x-ray. But we also make sense of all the other factors that can influence a person's pain experience. So the way we kind of look at it is 
whereas before the, the what happens in the joint was at the center of understanding of someone's pain experience now that becomes one of the many factors so for instance are you participating in physical activity or have you uh, you know, move yourself away from, from doing physical activity or are you doing physical activity that is beyond your current capacity uh, to tolerate load in that knee? Uh, are you sleeping well? You know, are you, do you have enough sleep? Um, or are you getting enough rest in your body? We know that if you uh, don't sleep, you don't have good quality or quantity of sleep. That can affect and set off some inflammatory processes in your body that sensitize uh, joints in your body and the, and the knee and the hip would be uh, definitely affected by it. Uh, do you carry any stress in your life? And another thing that stress will do is change the chemistry of your body and can create more sensitivity and, and pain. Uh, you know, in terms of your, of your body weight, uh, are you carrying more weight? Have you put on weight as a consequence of not being physically active uh, or because you're more isolated uh, or you have other health conditions that have led for you to uh, um, have a weight gain and in the past we associated weight with the fact that it increases the, the, the physical weight in the joint and that is that is of course true uh, but the other thing that is also true is that if you carry more especially abdominal fat uh, that changes your metabolism and, and increases pro-inflammatory markers in your system so you carrying weight actually makes you more prone to become sensitive uh, and, you know, there's some research that demonstrates that losing 10% uh, of your body weight, if you are overweight, can have a significant impact on, um, on the pain that you experience. So if we look at all those factors, we are moving away from fixing the joint and lubing it and replacing it to having a look at the overall perspective of the person's health uh, in order to manage it. So that's a much more contemporary understanding of how to manage this condition. Yeah, right. Um, so... That, that's all good and well, right? But we've got yeah. lots of patients that come and see us and, um, you know, the, one of the common things that they'll say is that, look, I understand about the stress, I understand about my sleep, but at the end of the day, my knee's bone on bone. Mm -hmm. um, they've either been told that, they've had an, an MRI or some sort of imaging to suggest mm -hmm. that. And um, so I guess, can you kind of talk to what that means? What's the role of imaging here in, in mm -hmm. osteoarthritis? Look, there, it has a role, there's no doubt. So we do know that what you see in a film, and particularly some of the things that JP talked about around um, inflammation around the bone. So we don't get pain from the cartilage, we get pain from the structures that are under the bone, and for some people they can become inflamed. So that means you could have um, two scenarios. You have two people with this, exactly the same looking film, the same degree of narrowing or, uh, of uh, cartilage loss, um, where there is bone on bone and one person is functioning at a relatively high level with minimal pain and the other person is really disabled with pain and and what doesn't differ the, the scan doesn't differentiate those two people what may differentiate them is the level the strength the conditioning the lifestyle factors that JP mentioned that we know are really important that can drive other processes so these things all interact mm. and so when we we you know i saw a lady today who's got bone on bone and um when i first saw her she had no to ability to tolerate loading in her leg and see so she was really disabled and she had a limp and she's now um able to walk every day and she's on a bike and she's strong now she still has bone on bone if you took an x-ray of her but her functional capacity her confidence in her leg her strength uh, and her mindset around her leg has completely changed mm. and that she now sees that, um, yeah, she has an arthritic knee. We, we can never take that away. But now she has a life that she can use her leg confidently. She has strength. Now she has to commit to that. So she has an ongoing program. But that's good for any human being with any health condition. Yeah. So it's not like... Um, and if, for example, she did end up down the track having surgery or an knee replacement, she is so much better off to come out of that well. And I think we don't see these th or, you know, this or, you know, one thing or other. Uh, it's like you have nothing to lose addressing those factors to then see at what level you can get yourself before you commit to the next step. Because we know that if you walk into surgery with a limp, you'll walk out of surgery with a limp. Mm. It doesn't change that. Mm. You know, having a new architecture in the knee doesn't give you a functioning knee. Yeah. And the functioning knee comes back to confidence and strength and mobility and, you know, your ability to, to, to integrate control of your body and your life. 
Yeah. So it's effectively yeah. shifting the, the goal or the, the lens from the arthritis to what can you do, what, how, yeah. how your pain levels, yeah. how's your function. Yeah. And all that can improve regardless of what happens on your... Yeah. On your and and I think the key thing there is not a panacea. Like we, but no one has a panacea. Yeah. You know, like we aren't talking about curing things. We're talking about improving people's quality of life, reducing their, you know, their pain levels, their need for medication, improving their function. But I think we need to be really honest about what we as a health profession can deliver for people. Some people can get fantastic outcomes and others, the outcomes are harder gained. Mm. And also if we look at the, you know, thinking of this theme of being bone on bone, um, one of the things that we know is that if you look at the health of the cartilage, uh, what hydrates the cartilage is movement. Mm. What makes the cartilage becomes, become healthier is loading the cartilage. So, in fact, if you have supposedly bone on bone and you have an unhealthy joint, taking your weight away from the joint or walking around uh, with, a, with a clenched muscles around the joint, you know, so if I had arthritis in my wrist. If I walk around with a clenched fist, and I brush my teeth and I write my name and I'm doing that all of that with a clenched fist and I protect it, I'm stressing that joint even more. So if you have um, arthritis in your knee, it means that the, the physiology of the knee has changed. But it doesn't mean that it's completely stagnated. It means that it's at a, at a point where it needs to readapt to, uh, to be able to tolerate load. And the only way of doing that is gradually teaching that joint how to tolerate load again. And if you look back at the, at the uh, you know, minute details of the joint, one of the things that people lose over time with osteoarthritis is the ability of the cartilage to uh, hold on to water. And if you don't move the joint, you lose that ability even further, and the joint stiffens up. If you gradually move it and you put weight on it and you give good muscles uh, around the joint, actually the ability to hold on to water increases. And that's what we see with these patients, that initially the you know, exercise and using the leg is hard, it's difficult, it's stiff, and it's uncomfortable. And at times, and it's common actually that sometimes increases pain. But over time, what happens is that they actually become quicker to move. They get better range, and they become stronger and more confident using the leg. And that's the paradox that they, at times, come up to us and say, but if I do have bone and bone, how come I'm doing more now? And I'm actually feeling better. And that's the beauty of the body, which is a, an organic, a biological structure that can deteriorate, but it can also be, if put in the right path, it can actually thrive in that and become a healthier joint. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And is it fair to say that lots of people aren't actually aware that they're, you know, walking, if you use the wrist <laughs> analogy, walking around with their wrist tense and they're, yeah. they're not aware that potentially even just... Um, tension of muscles might be contributing mm. to a, a certain aspect of mm. their pain as well. Absolutely. Um, it, it's almost like an automatic response of the body to protect the body region is to either take the weight away or to guard uh, around the joint. And that can be really helpful. You know, if you imagine that you step on something that is sharp, you know, your body automatically recoils the leg to take it away from it. Or if you sprain your ankle, you walk on a stiff ankle for a few days and you're limping. Uh, but over time, uh, you know, six weeks down the track, you know, the healing has occurred and you, there's no need for you to be protecting yeah. the leg anymore. But the person has to be very confident in themselves yeah. or have really good advice to understand that actually using the leg more feels better. And like today I saw a lady who's been, she brought the question to me. She said, you know, I've been told I, I'm a great candidate for knee replacement and I should do it, but I'm really scared of having surgery and I don't want to do that. And I, I'm a bit lost but I, because last year I couldn't actually get up and downstairs, but I've been forcing myself to do it and now I can. You know, I'm not in leaps and bounds, but I can do it. But I, I try not to do it because I don't think that that's right the thing to do, the right thing to do. So if you think about it, her belief is holding her back despite the fact that her experience is actually challenging that. Yeah. So us as clinicians, uh, our job is to, is to uh, make her reflect on that belief and, say, and take that positive experience that she's had and make her reflect on the benefits that that's, that's been having for her. And actually she realized today that moving her leg more and actually using the leg without protecting was in fact better. Yeah. So that sets off a new trajectory. You know, I think the other thing that um, we often see is so important is taking baby steps. You know, we often see people with pain go through a boom-bust <laughs> cycle where they, they go and overload a joint, it flares it up, they rest it, they get weaker, 
they get frustrated, they feel better, they get frustrated, they go and do it again. And this boom bust cycle is really bad for people's mental health and confidence and self belief. And it's almost like you you lose that sense of trust in your body. And I think part of that journey is to to take those little steps to go, it takes time to build confidence. It takes time to build low tolerance. It takes time for tissue to adapt. Mm. And that can be months. It can take months. It can be a journey over months of to change that process. And for some people, those changes can be quite quick and others a really hard journey. And for others, it's kind of marked by peaks and falls. Um, and that's, that's the key of a good coach, I think, is that that's our role, is to coach people um, to give them strategies, but also to catch them when they fall, to give them, to, you know, to reframe the program, and to dial it down and dial it up, and to make sure that it's within capacity, but also sensitive to the to the body's responses. Um, and that's a delicate journey, actually, for a lot of people. Yeah, it's not easy. No. Um, I just want to come back to a point that you talked about before in terms of imaging. Um, you sort of mentioned uh, that's a hypothetical case of someone that's got unilateral or one-sided knee pain. Yep. Um, it kind of made me think of a, a study that looked at um, shoulder imaging for people that had one-sided shoulder pain. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if that person had that one-sided knee pain and you imaged their other side or you did an X-ray and an MRI from their other side, are the chances that their, their knee would look pretty similar to their sore side? It depends. Um, so the lady I saw today it had a trauma to her knee, right. to, her, to her left knee, uh, and that was a side that was um, affected. And she's got a clear um, a varus deformity on her knee, very different to the other side. Now, and in her case, you could bet on it, they'd look different. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things we know is traumatic injury is one of the risk factors that could um, alter the health of that knee, that could change the trajectory for that joint. But if you had someone who um, has had a very similar life and history for two knees, pretty good chance they're going to look the same. Yeah. That, would be the, that would be the main uh, thought around that. The only other proviso around that probably is um, what we often do see is when someone might have had developed pain on a knee years ago and then they've developed a whole lot of unhelpful habits like JP's talked about mm -hmm. where they avoid loading that leg. And we literally see, I had a guy again last week, uh, half the size. Mm -hmm. Their leg is half the size. Now, the muscles. five years of loading a leg that's got half the strength of the other leg and they're trying to run and do stuff could really affect the health of that mm -hmm. knee. That, again, sets a trajectory where you may see a difference in imaging, where the, why, the health of that knee, it, this, it's like a less healthy knee than the other knee, that makes sense. Yeah. And so that's where you start seeing body parts changing in terms of their health based on how you care for it. Uh, and so, you know, the, my job uh, for this, this young guy is to get this leg back to where, and it started off with a, uh, like a traumatic injury that was never rehabilitated properly. Yeah. And, and now this is a leg he just favors all the time and it's not trustworthy. And now he's not just got pain in his knee, he's got it in his hip and his back. And, you know, you just see that whole process kind of um, escalate. Yeah. And also uh, it reminds me of a patient that I saw a couple of weeks ago who had a, uh, never had a history of any knee problems, no trauma, no incidents in the past. And he's over 50 and he was just walking and he tripped over and he tripped on the right knee. He didn't fall anything, just caught himself. And a couple of days later, he developed some knee pain and he became concerned about it. He went and saw the, the doctor x-ray the one knee and he's over 50. So, you know, the likelihood of you finding um, changes in your joint are greater as you grow older because that's what happens to the body. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they found that he had OA in the knee and they had bone on bone. And the next thing he's booked in to see an orthopedic consultant who looks at the x-ray and then he's going down the track of uh, potentially having surgery. And luckily the surgeon said, how about you try some physiotherapy to strengthen your legs? And he came in and I'm going, you never had a history in this knee. So the likelihood is that your knees look pretty much alike. You tripped over, you'd set off a... Uh, a, a response of that knee, the joint is irritated and you're not carrying the best of your health. So maybe that's when something like, you know, carrying a bit more weight, being inactive, being sedentary, not sleeping well, that, that tripping over is just a tipping point. And all those things then, then play up because he, it's not conditioned to use the leg and he's going up and up the stairs, carrying extra weight. 
so he started in a program and very quickly he started noticing some changes in, in paying his knee. So that is a very common case that, you know, people in the community over the age of 50 that develop pain gradually or with no history, they could be sent into this path because that is a yeah. very strong narrative for mm -hmm. understanding uh, mm -hmm. knee pain. And if you are in that bracket age and you get an x-ray, you will see changes mm. and that can set off this inevitable pathway to knee replacement. Uh, and, and at that time, you know, you may or may not be sent to seeing a, a physiotherapist, for instance, and, and then we can have a hard look at our own profession on, on mm -hmm. you know, doing physiotherapy, what does that entail? And it may entail, on one end, uh, a lot of passive therapy and some taping and some uh, careful consideration of what you should do, or it can entail looking at all the factors that can affect your pain and target those modifiable factors and empower you to become uh, in control of this condition as we've been talking about, which is a much more, um, uh, it's an approach that is much more aligned with the contemporary understanding of pain and osteoarthritis. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Is it fair to say the take home from that kind of imaging story with, mm -hmm. with that guy that had just developed knee pain after the fall is that if you did imaging before, you know, let's say a day before mm -hmm. his fall and a day after his fall when he had the pain, that those two films would look pretty much exactly the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the key thing there is that his pain wasn't there at the start and it was there in the end. So it kind of exactly. speaks to that poor relationship between mm. imaging findings and yeah. um, and pain and disability. Yeah. yeah. And, and, the, and the tricky aspect of this is that that reflection on the films and sitting someone down and asking them to think about that, it's not so easily identified or you can't find that so easily. But you can go easily on Google and say, I've got knee pain, I'm over the age of 50, first diagnosis that will come up is osteoarthritis. What do you do for that? You inject, you do a bit of exercise. If it doesn't work in a few months, you go and you have a knee replacement. Mm. So that pathway is really strong. And that's the problem that we face as clinicians. And, and the, the biology and the changes in the knee, are, they're really strong and they're really present. And they can affect uh, how you, you, you decide your management. But again, all these other factors can be modifiable. And in someone like this particular gentleman, uh, the story was not to operate on that knee. The story was to get, just get him active again and desensitize the knee. And he may or may not need surgery in the future, but that's not because of what happened now. Yeah, sure. You know, I think um, just along from that, I, I kind of it springs two cases to mind. One of us, an 80-year-old man, I saw I'd seen previously for back problems. He'd never reported knee pain. Uh, and they moved house. Um, it was a pretty stressful time. They'd kind of moved out of their home into a, like a retirement village. Well, that was a massive stress, massively stressful transition where he reduced it. He used to eat, walk every day. He stopped walking. He put on weight, probably about 10 kilograms. He developed knee pain. His knee was acutely painful. Um, he had an ex ex MRI scan, was told he needed a re knee replacement. He came back to see me just for an opinion, and I've gone, well, you've now had an injury. <laughs> like, you've actually done less exercise. You know, what's precipitated you getting worse? It's a really stressful time in your life. You put on a whole lot of weight, you've lost conditioning, and you've stopped exercising. So that's an injury to me. You know, sure, you've got these scans, things, that are, and he, he had like a, a really acute, you know, like um, bone edema very sore so i've gone well let's just give it three months because you had nothing to lose and everything to gain so let's set up a plan where you lose that weight we get you strong with simple exercises like sit and stands and getting your you know basic strength back in your legs let's get you back into a exercise program all his pain went away all of it went away and he's going i don't get it i don't get how i could have been so acutely painful and my knee is degenerate and it needs a knee replacement but i don't have any pain in it and that's because those factors that JP highlighted have been dealt with that have dampened that inflammatory response in the body. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, I saw a young lady today, 35, who's been told she's got knee OA. Well, she's going with 35. So what, when did it start? Start the last year. So what's happened the last year? Well, I've been in a busy job, lots of stress, not exercising, put on weight. Same thing, but at the other end of the spectrum. So she's got the early signs. The other guy had the late signs, but never got pain until those factors emerged. She's got them at the age of 35. What's she done? She's seen a physio, gave us a massage. Like, didn't work. So she's now stopped, you know, like careful with her knees, tries not to bend them. 
so we had a great opportunity today. So, hey, let's see you up the plan. And she was going, maybe if I worn them out when I was dancing, I go, no, that's what would have kept your joints healthy. Yep. What's happened in the last few years, you've put on a whole lot of weight, stopped exercising, you've lost conditioning. That's what's going to affect the health. And that's the narrative that is not told to people. Yep. Now, I think the other thing that strikes me in the health area is we want quick fixes. And this, to actually get health in your body is a journey, and it's a journey of a lifetime. And that might take you months, it might take you years, but it's part of your journey. Uh, and I think that's the story we need to really sell hard to people, is that you just can't cut pain out. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's a journey of getting healthy, and that's a, that's a partnership. It's a partnership within your home environment, um, and the people we see do really well, have wonderful support within their um, home environment. Uh, it's much harder if that's not working for you. Uh, but it's also a partnership with your care environment, with your GP and you know physio or who else you're working with, psychology or dietitian, as well if that's necessary. Yeah. Now, interestingly, when we look at health and health problems such as cardiac problems or respiratory problems or diabetes, uh, it's very easy for people now to understand that you know the management of some of those conditions they are multifactorial, and you need to take care of things such as your diet, your sleep, your physical activity your stress levels, so that is very acceptable. And joint pain and other body pains have kind of been seen in a, in a different place where it's kind of, it's not your health, it's, it's joint pain. And therefore is related to something structural in your body. So we are playing catch up. And now the more we talk about these conditions, if you take knee away out of this conversation and you put back pain or you put neck pain, or you put something like other health conditions, the factors that we need to be working on are very similar because they are factors that reflect our general health. So you having a, you know, a good body weight, you sleeping well, you managing your stress, uh, you feeling like you're supported at work and you engage well in society and you're physically capable of doing the activities that, you're, uh, that your job requires or your lifestyle requires, uh, it speaks for your entire health. And that's, that's where we come from when we talk about Near way of being a, a, um, changing that narrative from uh, a knee disease and damage to a knee health perspective. And that basically ties in a lot of musculoskeletal conditions. And, you know, there was a, a, some lovely papers that came out last year talking about, uh, you know, lifestyle as being a, a very important aspect to address uh, across several comorbid health conditions. And one of the underpinning um, mechanisms that can drive lots of these conditions is an inflammatory process. And inflammatory processes, they can come on with changes like the cases that Pete highlighted. You know, they can come on really strongly if you had a fall, if you had a, a trauma, or they can come on when several factors in your body uh, respond in a different way. So we have these all these um, uh, domains in our body that speak for uh, you know, your general health and your immune system and your, uh, your physical uh, system and your nervous system. And they're interplaying along the way and keeping the status quo and, and you're going, okay. But at, at a point in time, you may get, become highly distressed, you don't sleep well, you put on weight and you become less conditioned and that can tip you over the edge and that can affect your health. Now, the outcome of that, it could be pain. It could be a skin condition. It could be stomach pain. It could be, you know, another health condition that can come up. So the, it's almost like pain is another expression of a change in balance on factors that speak for your health. Yeah, yeah. Kind of an, an unhealthy person in, in a big picture sense. Mm. Yeah. And that could be temporary or it could be long term. Yeah, yeah. And I think just along that, then we can use that knowledge to reflect on our own lifestyle and our own health. Mm. Um, rather than becoming a threat to say, oh, God, I better stop using my body. It's, it's a wake-up call to go, whoa, am I going to bed on time? <laughs> you know, am I exercising enough? Am I keeping fit? Am I keeping strong? Am I grady? And am I, am I doing the right, you know, am I, am I doing a sensible amount of activity for my body's cap capacity? Because that's the other certainly common thing that we would see with people, you know, and, and I'm sure this is going to come out of the COVID period where people, you know, are frustrated as hell at being cooped up and just go and do boot camp. It's, like, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's a recipe to disaster because yeah. the body is not conditioned to that degree of load. And sure. no doubt we'll see a whole, you know, flurry of people coming in. Who, and, and the problem with that, it gives back exercise a bad name. 
because people go, oh, I can't do that anymore. And then they get scanned, oh, you're worn out. So I'll give that away. And that is so common yeah. um, where people really that good. experience a pain when it's not uh, a, a pain related to exercise, when it's not graded right, yeah. um, gives a toxic experience that makes people think it shouldn't be done. And that's a problem with the loading, not with the exercise. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's all yeah. about dose and, again, and capacity. It, yeah, and it, and it creates another narrative, which is, which is this idea that pain relates to injury. Exactly. So I haven't been exercised. I started exercising. I got sore. I injured myself exercising. Well, as a matter of fact, you just did a bit too much and your body wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And it became sensitive, mm. which is very different. Because if something is sensitive, you, you kind of scale back for a couple of days yeah. and you gradually build it up yeah. to become healthy again and desensitized. Yeah, cool. I want to kind of wrap it up with, a, with maybe three more questions that we can try and answer relatively quickly. Okay. Um, the, the first one is around, mm. so, you know, all these factors that you're talking about, changing your lifestyle, um, changing how much you sleep, changing your beliefs around your knee or your hip or your osteoarthritis sound like really important things. And we know they are really important things that can help people improve. But when you have that as one option, and that might take, like you say, quite a journey of a few weeks, a few mm. months, so it's actually mm. really a, should be a forever journey. Mm. And then you pair that up against a surgery which is you know, seen as a quick fix, mm. uh, that typically patients aren't out of pocket for that, even though they cost you know, mm. three, four, five, God knows how many what times more than a proper exercise yeah. um, program. And we, we know all the guidelines suggest that exercise, education and weight, clo- weight loss are the cornerstones of management, yet it's not happening. Mm. Um, and, and part of that, I think, is because it's easier to get a quick mm. fix. It's easier and, and it yeah. seems like mm. it's, there's this perception that it's, you're just going to go in there. You don't have to do much work mm. for it. Yeah. Um, I kind of wanted you guys to talk about the GLAD program, which is something that started in Denmark. A mm. um, bunch of researchers over there were kind of getting frustrated that this was the, the common path. Um, and yeah, I was hoping you could sort of talk to that, talk to that because that's something that initially um, patients had to pay for that program in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the moment in Australia, they have to pay for that, but it's now been fully funded in Denmark by the government, and um, patients are getting pushed down that path. So, can you briefly talk about that, please? Sure, sure. So the the, the Glad program was a, a, a initiative in response to the evidence that was already well established for for osteoarthritis. So there's more than 50 randomized control trials demonstrating that exercise and a form of education and, and weight loss can be effective for reducing pain and improving function for people with knee OA. Mm-hmm. So as you rightly said, they implemented that. And the program is basically a couple of sessions educating patients on contemporary understanding of knee osteoarthritis or knee and hip osteoarthritis. Uh, and after that, there are 12 group sessions that patients will do, and they are supervised exercise sessions. So over six weeks, so twice a week, they will come in and they will do a series of exercises that are, while, although they are um, provided in a group environment, they are tailored to the person's level of condition. So as Pete um, rightly said before, that it, it depends on your level of entry in an exercise program. So the, the exercises are gradually progressed. And what I noticed is that once they got people through that program, uh, initially people were actually are getting uh, some level of discomfort in their knee. And the exercises were adjusted, but they kept going gradually and progressively up. And what they found is that at the end of the program, so they did that for six weeks by, under supervision, and then they were encouraged to do for another six weeks by themselves at home. And the exercises are designed for them to be able to do at home uh, by themselves as well. Um, and they found that there was a, a, a 35% reduction in pain intensity at the end of the program. And the willingness to forego surgery at the end of that program was quite high. In fact, up to a year and two years later, uh, a high percentage of patients uh, will be um, not interested in having surgery because they feel like they are doing the things that they, they want in life and they are in control of their, of their pain. So that program is... Um, it was packaged in a way that it could be, um, it has a, a research component into it, and it's a way that making sure the clinicians that are delivering that are delivering the right dose of exercise and education. Because that's another thing, you know, Pete talked about before, patients going up and down mm-hmm. with their exercise, and, you know, your exercise gets sore, you rest. Whereas this program puts you in a, in a, in a structure where you keep moving forward. 
you may fluctuate in terms of the intensity, but you keep going forward. And the reason for that is that there is a minimum dose of regular exercise that patients need to do. So you take baby step, baby steps, but you do that regularly and progressively. And over a three months period, that's when you can see changes in your physical capacity, in your mm-hmm. function, and your pain intensity. So the GLAD program is one program that is out there uh, that is offered in a group environment. So some of the things that we talked about before can be delivered um, in a one-on-one set, uh, uh, setting, but also the group setting works really well for other people. And also in terms of being um, quite affordable for uh, for the community as well. Yeah, sure. And we'll put links to the um, GLAD website so people can find out more because there's yeah. loads of clinics and clinicians around Australia that are that are yeah. offering that. Mm-hmm. And a couple of years ago, the uh, La Trobe University, some researchers there, um, so uh, Kate Crosley, Christian Barton, and Joe Kemp, they were directly involved with a group in Denmark and they brought that initiative to Australia. So they've been now collecting data uh, and training clinicians across Australia. So in every uh, major city in Australia, you can find a GLAD program. And uh, we were invited to partner with them. So we brought that program to Perth. Uh, and we have trained more than 100 clinicians in Perth. Now they can deliver that same program. And the cool thing about this is that it's not just an initiative to get patients through the door in the clinic. Because if you come into a GLAD class, it means that your, if you consent to it, your data is taken to a database that is central in Australia. So we are providing good care, which is evidence-based care for patients, but you're also collecting data for what? To understand the trajectory of these patients, but also to have enough data to then go to the private health funds and go to the government and say, look, there is an alternative here. And look at the story in Denmark. Is that something that we want to reproduce? Yeah. So that data will be sure. coming out soon. And I think the key is there that, you know, although, yes, it involves at least six weeks of, of structured rehabilitation, yeah. Um, they have really good outcomes. You know, one of the, yeah. the like you kind of alluded to the statistics of um, these people were on a wait list for surgery, mm. and at a year, the year follow up mark, seventy five percent hadn't had their surgery, mm. and then at two years, it was sixty six percent that still hadn't yeah. had their surgery. So although there's a bit of work involved, mm. um, it's actually a, shows to be quite quite effective, and it's probably not necessarily just the fact that it's. Um, you know, the, the title of this, that is GLAD and it's exercise, but it's actually a dosage of exercise. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. forcing people to get that minimum dose. And mm. just around that, it's interesting. Um, people often think, now I've got my knee replaced, I'm going to be get active. It yeah. doesn't happen. Yeah. Mm. So it doesn't, there's lots of research to show that people's levels of activity really don't change once they've had a knee replacement. Mm where something like this program gives them uh, confidence and strategies to get active. That's that's a whole health benefit. Mm-hmm. That's going to benefit potentially your social, mental, physical, cardiovascular, every health system in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a broad health intervention, actually. It's not just about your knee away. Yeah. And probably pre- uh, previous to GLAD being implemented in Denmark, they've done studies where they looked at people that were going for knee replacement and they offered this uh, a similar program and they went through knee replacement versus another group that didn't do a, a, a structured program. So both groups went through knee replacement, but their outcomes afterwards in terms of returning to function, yeah. uh, being able to do things that they wanted, and the outcome of the surgery was better in the group that had done mm-hmm. a minimum dose. Yeah. And the scary statistic is that if you look at the number of patients that go into knee replacement in Australia, or I'm sorry, worldwide, is up to 38% of patients that go to knee replacement without having done evidence-based, yeah. uh, uh, like a program before uh, being offered surgery. Yeah. So that's a pretty staggering statistic that a lot of people actually would have got would have got better outcomes after surgery or, in fact, wouldn't need surgery for a long time or ever. Yeah, and it's probably important to mention that, you know, this doesn't mean that people never need surgery. No, no, no absolutely, uh, not. absolutely not. I think no. we're probably important to make clear um, yeah, that's true. that it's a really quite an effective surgery in the right people. Yeah, yeah that's um, right. Uh, we just need to make sure that the, the, the funnels are set up in a way that we yeah. capture those people that yeah. don't need to have... And, and that's why I said it's a win-win because, you know, you get yourself healthy and fit uh, and strong yeah. sets you up for a better outcome for yeah. surgery or it gives you the choice. Yeah. Can't lose on that. So, do, sorry, go. No, the other point I was going to make is that some people end up going for surgery on the on the premise that you you know you're bone on bone and um, and actually if you have a, a really um, 
severe changes in your knee and you try and you exhausted your exercise approach and you've been educated, you lost weight, actually having the surgery puts you in a really good position to recover some function afterwards. Mm. The problem is that people that don't tend to respond very well are people that have less severity of mm. changes in their knee away, which kind of uh, alludes to the possibility that there are other factors that are driving that irritation. Mm. And about one in five people that go for that surgery may not get the outcomes that they were yeah. expecting. Absolutely. Um, so in a time during COVID at the moment, elective surgeries, including knee replacements and hip replacements, have effectively been cancelled. They've been brought back on in Australia, but certainly not all, everywhere around the world. Um, can you talk to a potential silver lining around the, those surgeries being um, cancelled? And we've kind of alluded to it, but just to make it really clear for the listeners. Yeah, look, I think what happens is people often feel like they might have had physiotherapy. And you've got to say, what is it? You don't just have a doctor. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what kind of treatment did you have from your physiotherapist? And if it, and I always say to people, if it, if, if it wasn't uh, the physio working as a coach that gave you educate, evidence-informed education, that gave you a program that put you in charge, that graded it up to get you stronger, if you weren't more, if stronger and more confident, fitter and healthier at the end of that program, you didn't get it. Um, so that's the first thing is because a lot of people go onto a wait list like JP said, not, not all because some don't even get that opportunity. Yeah. Some do. Have, might have seen a physio, lady I saw today, massage. That's not physiotherapy. It's not evidence-based physiotherapy for knee pain. Um, so the first thing is what kind of treatment have you had? Um, use that time wisely because you might be on a wait list for surgery. Use that time wisely because most people sit on a wait list and literally sit on a wait list. So um, <laughs> seek out evidence-based treatment. So like the DAB program, or people who um, uh, will uh, commit to coach you to get well or to pr- uh, protect your health. Um, the other things that you can do now um, that will, may not, will, you know, that's not a fix, but it may improve your quality of life and it may reduce your pain and it may reduce your distress and it may give you an opportunity to, Decide whether you need the surgery or not, or it will put you in a better place to have the surgery. Even if you do have it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And, and good luck. Uh, GLAD stands for good life with arthritis in Denmark. I think exactly. it's important Correct. to mention. That's one yeah. of the most common questions we get. Um, so I kind of want to wrap it up with something really practical for, for our listeners. Mm-hmm. So um, JP, you were involved in a paper last year that kind of looked at um, what are the what are the recommendations we should should make for um, osteoarthritis? Um, kind of breaking down the myths yep. um, and then kind of supplementing them with facts. So this is the um, infographic that was produced out of that, which we'll, again we'll link to in the show notes. Um, really quickly, can you talk to talk to this and and maybe this can be our we have a, we finished the podcast with a to try today segment, which tries to make information or turn information into action. Um, and maybe that can be the t- to try today is to have a look at this uh, yeah. infographic and kind of reflect on, okay, is that something that I believe and where can I change? Um, so I was wondering whether you could talk about that particular, sure. um, some of the myths there. So, so I think uh, the, what the infographic does, it, it summarizes well what we talked about today. So we have a, at the top of the infographic, we talk about the myths and the facts. And some of the myths are around the fact that, you know, pain always equals damage. The surgery, uh, such as total knee replacement, is inevitable if you do have uh, knee joint pain and the exercise is harmful. So, and to all of those things are things that we talked about today where they are not, uh, they are not entirely true. And some of the facts that support that go against that is the fact that, yes, surgery can be helpful for the right candidate that has trialed and exhausted the right dose of program of evidence-based care, which includes education, exercise, and weight loss for those that need. Uh, and then people tend to respond better. Exercise is not harmful if done if it started at a, at, a, at a graduated manner and progressive slowly and within your capacity at that time to achieve your goals. And pain doesn't always equal damage. You know, we talked about all the factors, and that's the next step of the of the infographic, where we have uh, we changed uh, from knee pain to have knee health at the center, and we have all these other factors that uh, you know they go from lifestyle, uh, psychological factors, and biological factors such as. Do you have a history of trauma in that knee? Do you have enough conditioning in that leg? Uh, do you have uh, bone edema on your skin? So 
all those factors into play to present or, or to affect the person's knee health that, or where those structures may become sensitive or not. So if you do have the knee pain, how do you, um, how do you manage that? And some of the, on the mid side and things that are considered as low value care is if you provide massage by itself, dry needling by itself, or you send patients with foam rollers and spiky balls and they're doing that or electrotherapy. So all those things, they will not, uh, they may provide some symptomatic relief uh, for mechanisms that we are not going to discuss here today, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they're not going to provide you to get your long-term goal. Uh, so some of the cases that we talked about today that have been offered just that, that is not uh, um, a process where the patient can learn through. And Pete talked about education and, you know, so you need to be educated. You need to be guided through an active approach. You may or may not need to lose weight. You may or may not need to uh, manage your stress and your sleep. But one of the things that is really important is that education is not sitting the patient down and taking them through this and lecturing them. Education is a, is a process. And the process is the journey where they tried a few exercises. They got a bit sore. We need to change the way we do that. Uh, they had a flare up and they realized that they need to change a few things or they went a bit too fast or they, you know, they actually didn't work on their weight and now they need to do that. So this journey is an education process, a learning process where the patient starts to understand how the knee flares up and how they respond or not to that progress. So on the high value care is basically all these things that we're talking about. So if you go and you see a physio, what do you want to hear? You want someone that uh, listens to your story, you know, did you have a trauma? Did you trip over? Or this started out of the blue when you're moving houses, for instance, or at a time where you're highly stressed and sedentary and etc. And based on that story, what are your goals? What are the things you want to do? What is your current physical capacity? What are your habits? Do you have unhelpful habits? Can we break them? Are they helpful when you break them? And then set up a plan that is not just given by the physio, but a plan that is uh, you know, it's a dual process where yeah. both of you and the patient are um, designing that plan and then you go, you know, the process from here on is that I'll guide you until you achieve your goals and you learn how to manage that condition. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, guys. Thanks, um, Kevin. I think it's going to be really Pleasure. helpful for, for our listeners. Pleasure. Thank you. So there you have it. Another episode of Empowered Beyond Pain. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast, so please reach out to Pete, JP, or I via Twitter, or you can just email at podcast at bodylogic.physio. Next week, we have a guest host in the form of the award-winning Jennifer Passard. Jennifer is the manager of health services at Arthritis and Osteoporosis Western Australia, a non-governmental organisation that offers a range of support services for people with arthritis. We look forward to her interviewing a leading expert in osteoarthritis. But until then, stay safe, stay active, be kind, and remember to ask, is there more to pain than damage? Please note, what you heard on this episode of Empowered Beyond Pain is strictly for information purposes only and does not substitute individualised care from a trusted and licensed health professional. If you would like individualised high value care for your pain, sports or pelvic health problem, head to the Bodylogic website and make an appointment. Theme music generously provided by Fervin and Cash.